Uh, this morning, I wanted to start with reading uh, just the, the little bit of what Larry read already. And I'm just going to read from Luke 24, 2 to 7, actually, is the, the, what I'm going to be reading this morning. In Luke uh, 24, 2 to 7, it says, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that um, gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you this while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners and be crucified and on the third day be raised again. That's kind of like the core message of the gospel, the, the, the idea that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again on the third day. It's kind of the core message of, of Easter and the Easter message. Jesus Christ died on the cross and on the third day he rose again. The tomb was empty. And of course, we hear this lots and it just becomes a story that we hear. And oftentimes it doesn't maybe affect us um, like it should. And so this morning, what I want to do is because the message of Easter is really just the kind of the message of the gospel. I want to just present a simple message of the gospel. Now, as I was doing this, as I was preparing a simple message of the gospel, I read through a couple of the tracks that we have at the back there, and, and I was like, okay, simple message, simple message. Uh, and then, you know, after, as I was kind of writing that first kind of point, uh, it got to be quite long, and I was like, man, this is not really a simple message. There is this aspect of the message of Jesus Christ, which is quite simple, and it, it's basically this, that as sinners, we go our own way, we do our own thing, and we do kind of ignore the will and way of the, of the ultimate, holy, uh, absolute creator God. That's kind of the, the message. So we go our own way, and it's not the way that God would have us go. And, we, uh, and so because he is holy and good, and, and he is purely holy and good, it seems that any other way that is not his way would be not, purely and, not pure and holy and good. And unfortunately, that's the way we go. And then God sent Jesus Christ to fix that problem, to, to, to fix and to forgive the problem of sin in our lives and in our hearts. And, that's, and so we believe in Jesus, and uh, we are saved. There you go, the simple message, right? But then when you get into explaining that, you realize the Word of God actually explains this in three or four different lights. It focuses on the, the, the penalty of sin. It focuses on the blood of Jesus. It focuses on like this judicial kind of focus. And then it also focuses on this broken relationship kind of, and it's, it's relational, that sin causes brokenness. It, it causes a brokenness between people. It causes hurt. Then we, as we read the Word of God, we recognize that it talks about it in this, in this sense of a lamb, an atonement, that in order for us to be saved, something has to be given, right? In order for, for that, that sin brings death, and in order for death to be forgiven or, or passed over, that there needs to be this blood. And when you actually look through the, the, the Scriptures, there's a lot there. And it makes sense because God didn't just give us a track. Now, I'm not saying anything against tracks. I love tracks, okay? There's a bunch in the back. If you want to grab some, go for it. But God gave us this. And in His Word, there is this simple message of truth. But then as you get into it, you recognize that there is this also this complexity with this message. And I, I say it often, but I think with God, everything, with everything with God, often there's this simple side to it, and then there's this completely complex side that you can spend your life studying and probably still not fully grasp. And that makes sense, right? Because the idea of God existing is actually a simple understanding. But then the idea that who is that God, well, that gets complex. That gets a little bit more complex. And then even yourself, you understand yourself in the same way. I mean, it's, it's this simple complexity is throughout all of creation, all of what God has made. In ourselves, we kind of know who we are, you know? But then as you kind of get into understanding yourself and trying to figure out who you are and maybe sometimes more, more so why you do what you do, there's all of a sudden this deeper complexity that you're like, man, why do I do that? And maybe even more so we recognize this 
when we look at others and we think, well, why can't it be more like that? But yet somehow, as much as we try just to be more like that, we can't necessarily just be more like that. So within what God makes, not only in God's message, but within God himself and in what he makes, we find this simple complexity. So forgive me as I go through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I just kind of share the gospel this morning for this Easter service. Forgive me if I miss something. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be ignorant of all that there is. It's just that it's hard to come up with just the simple, clear message of the gospel, because there is much there. And perhaps often, as we have in the past as the church, we try to make the gospel so simple so that people can understand, but then people go, well, that doesn't quite make sense because that just leaves me with a thousand questions. And it leaves us with a thousand questions because sometimes the simpleness of it seems a little, little simple as you, as you investigate the complexity of your own life and the complexity of this world, right? And so, therefore, uh, I want to say, I want to share you the simple go- message of the gospel, but also, I want to encourage you, there is so much more that you're going to have to, like, that you, you need to dig into. And I say that because I know that probably even here in this room, there are three kind of hearers. There are three different types of hearers that are, that are here this morning. And the first group of hearers are those that haven't really heard the message of Jesus Christ before, right? And so those people, I, I pray that if you haven't heard it, and, and maybe online, the people that, that'll watch in time, that if you haven't heard the message, that this will just bring, a, bring you a step closer to understanding the message of Jesus Christ and why Easter is so important, why the empty tomb, what it means for us as humans. Then there's the second group of hearers that have heard this a thousand times. And I pray that this is not none of us, that this is none of us here, but we have heard it a thousand times and it has become something that we totally agree with and we say we believe and that we trust and the, we love the message and, 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 and it's all good, but we don't actually truly know the person of Jesus Christ. So we know the message, but we don't know the person. And I think there's two reasons for this. The first reason is that although um, these people would agree with the Bible and what the Bible teaches, that they would recognize, yeah, Jesus is Lord, they're living pretty good lives. And their lives are going pretty good in the direction that they're going. So even though they understand Jesus is Lord, and like when I get to heaven, it'll be great to be with this Jesus Lord uh, character, but like in my life right now, it's going pretty good. And I don't I don't feel like I need someone else to be leading my life right now. I'm doing okay, right? But of course, we know that if we don't actually truly know Jesus as Lord and let him into our lives to be Lord of our lives, we don't actually truly know Jesus, and then we don't actually truly know the message of the gospel. The second reason, and it's very similar to the first, is that, is that you know, they've heard people that are, that are hearers uh, have heard, heard the message of the gospel. They've, they've heard it a hundred times. And they agree that, yep, Jesus is Lord. Yep, that's good. That's good and all. And they would agree with that. And they would, they would agree that Jesus is Savior. And they would say, absolutely, Jesus is Savior. But most then relegate the, um, that idea of saving to Jesus is Savior of my death. That when I die, Jesus will save me and I will go to heaven. And they kind of relegate Jesus as Savior to that alone. Well, when I die, Jesus will save me. And, that's, and then they do this because, um, oftentimes because they don't actually see the evil in their lives now. For themselves, they're doing actually pretty good. Right? I'm, I'm okay, I don't do everything perfect. But I'm not really that bad of a person. There are, a person. there are a lot of people that are way more evil than me. The things that I do are like little white things. And yes, in order to go to heaven and not to hell, I'll need Jesus to save me when, I'm, when, I, you know, when I die. But to, like, to walk daily recognizing that I need Jesus to save me today? Well, I'm, I'm not that bad of a person today. I do a lot of good things today. So Jesus is Savior of my, when I die. But Jesus isn't Savior of my life right now. Because I'm a pretty good person. And so these hearers, of course, we have, we have to say to these hearers, we have to say, yes, 
it is good that you kind of agree with the Bible, that you recognize Jesus as Lord and you recognize Jesus as Savior, but you are sinful. You are wicked. And that if you don't let Jesus into your life to be your Savior daily, then you probably don't actually know Jesus or truly know the message of the gospel. Then there's the third group, and I pray that this is us here today. And it is that those that have heard the message of Jesus Christ and they understand the Easter story, and every time they hear it, they fall deeper in love with, it, with him. And they love this story because they know that this story is all they really have to hold on to because they recognize who they are as sinners, and they recognize who Jesus is as Lord and Savior. And so they have let Jesus into their life as Lord and Savior. And each day as they wake up, they say, Lord, Savior, come be with me today. Show me where to go. Show me what to do. Forgive me when I respond in that old nature. Forgive me when I'm just living in me. Help me live in you. And we love to hear this message, and I pray this morning that you, you love to hear this message. So then what is this message? What has Jesus done for us on this Easter Sunday? Well, it, it can be shared in many ways, but this is how I see it. The first thing I see is that I look around and I see broken. I see that, uh, that there, there is brokenness and sin and wickedness everywhere. I look at how governments send their soldiers to try and take over other countries that don't belong to them, and they encourage them to kill the innocent. This is broken. This is sinful. This is evil. If we look at history of man, there has always been an aspect of broken and evil, right from Adam and Eve all the way to today. And often we try to hide it. We try to sanitize it. We don't want to make it look so bad. But it's there. Man is broken. He is bent on being selfish and sinful, and he does evil things to each other. In fact, each man and woman seems to have a sense of this self-worth. Even you and me seem to have this. That although sometimes we try to hide it, it comes out and it reveals that we think ourselves better than others. Think ourselves as more um, deserving of good than others. Think ourselves as smarter than others. Think ourselves as more righteous than others. Think uh, that our wrong is not as bad as other people's wrong, even though it's the, often the same exact wrong. But their wrong is terrible and worth talking about. And, and sharing with others, can't believe that they did that. Because of their wrong, we look down on them and we see them differently. We see ourselves better, better as them. We see that what they do is unforgivable. But in our, our wrong, our wrong is forgivable. Our wrong is forgivable. In fact, even to say our wrong is understandable... You would understand why I did that. Well, sure, it wasn't great, but you would understand why if you understood my situation. So yes, it's wrong, but it's, it's forgivable when I do it. And of course, we think that other people shouldn't be talking about our wrong. That's wrong. They don't understand my situation. They're judging me. They shouldn't be talking about my wrong. We hide things. We are ashamed of things. We ignore things. We feel guilty about things. This is all a part of brokenness, sin, and wickedness. We hide because often we live in fear of people finding out just what we did or what we think or what happened to us. Or even we hide, what, we hide sometimes because we don't want others to people to, th to know what we actually like, what we actually want sometimes. We hide because of sin, fear, wicked, brokenness. See, the broken of the, 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 the sin and the wickedness in the world, we, we all have a little bit of that, of that in us. The Bible says we all have sin. Psalms 14, 23, even in the Old Testament, the Lord looked down from heaven and on all mankind to see if there was anyone who understood, anyone who seeks God, all have turned away, all have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. 
Now, we read this passage, and I think most of us, are, we would agree with the idea that, yeah, we don't seek God always. We're, we're, we're often seeking, about, seeking other things. Okay. And when we would say, yeah, it's probably true that, that we have all gone our own way. We don't always go God's way. Okay, that's, that's true too. But we often struggle with this idea that no one does good. I think this is where I kind of argue. How does the Bible say no one does good? Excuse me. I do good. I mean, maybe you're thinking you do good, but in the context of Scripture, the good that it's speaking to here is the God's understanding of good, the way He understands good, and the way that God understands good is absolute. Truly being good or truly doing good in God's eyes means being good and doing good absolutely, and that means never doing anything that is not good. We fail at being always good, don't we? And if you do a little, a little good and maybe a little bad, which we probably all would admit to, then we're not truly, as God sees it, good. For if you do a little good and a little bad, you are truly one who, is, who does good sometimes. And seeing God, God is completely holy and perfect. He's not looking for, to spend eternity with people that do good sometimes, right? He can't actually. For us to go to heaven, we have to be those that do good always. Romans 3.23 reads, For all have sinned and shall fallen short of the glory of God. We have all willingly taken part in sin, in the not good. And we know that the consequences of sin is death. Romans 6.23 reads, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our sin brings death. It brings physical and spiritual death. But note, the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We are all sinners. Sin makes us deserving of death. And if we die in our sin, if we die still holding on to our own way, we will have to pay for our own sin. It is only just that sin and wrong are paid for. And I think we'd all agree with that. It is just that sin and evil. We'd all think that we we probably all are hoping that Putin gets what he deserves, right? But yet, if it's just, then we should get what we deserve as well. But God loves us. And because of His love, God chose to show us His mercy and grace. God's first response to the world's sin and brokenness, and God's first response to your sin and brokenness, to my sin and brokenness, and guys, this is where the the gospel should like, this is where it should be like, yes, this is good. His first response to me was grace and mercy. His first response to the world was grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. And how did he show grace and mercy? By sending Jesus Christ. That is why this verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is a gift from God that allows for us to have eternal life in Jesus Christ rather than eternal hell as our sin and evil is justly punished. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. God loves mankind. And if you get anything, remember this, God loves you. And I pray that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that is, that is uh, something that you remember and you cling on to and that you could just say to yourself, I could not hear that enough. Well, I breathe on this earth the truth that God loves me. The creator God who made me also loves me. And because of his love, God sent Jesus Christ, his son, to take our place in the just punishment for the sin we have done. Because remember, the wages of sin is death. For things to be made right or just justice to happen against our sin Sin must be punished by death. And if sin is punished by death, and I am a sinner, then sinners are to be punished by death. Sin brings death, and therefore it is justified. It is justly punished by death. Now that is a quick little statement, okay? That's like a quick little tiny statement, but there is like so much that you need to, uh, to read to understand that and to, to, to grasp the depth of that. I'm going to say it again. 
Sin brings death, and therefore it is justly punished by death. I think oftentimes, guys, we recognize this in little ways, that sin brings death. So when I'm, that, that I'm actually, so that, pay attention to what that means. That means I'm a death bringer, even as a pastor. If I go my own way, even as a Christian, grew up in a Christian home, study the scriptures, spend a lot of time in that, that when I go my own way, I am a death bringer. And of course, you would agree, right? Putin right now is being incredibly selfish, right? And what is he bringing with his agenda? What does he bring with his, this is what I want, and I want it my way? He brings death. So it's easy to see that in others, but I have to recognize in myself that as I go my own way, it also brings death. Now, it might not bring physical death, but when I have a bad day at work and I go home to, like, kick the cat, you know what I'm saying? We talk about this a bit, right? I don't own a cat. I just have a bunch of kids. So, so then who do I kick, so to speak? And just to be clear, I don't kick my children. Okay, we don't need a visit from social services or anything, okay? But who am I a little bit angst towards? Who am I not so patient with? Who am I not so loving with? Who am I? Maybe I have just so much at work that I stop spending time with them and I stop paying attention to them. And they're like, hi, Dad, how's your day? And I'm like, it was good, fine, thanks. And then I go to get whatever I need done, done. Does that not, you think, in their heart, being little or even bigger, does that not maybe bring a little death to that relationship between us? Right? We are death bringers when we act in our own way. When a father molests a, a daughter, death bringer. When a grandparent doesn't even, you know, is too busy to pay attention to their grandkids, death bringer. When a husband looks at another, looks at another woman lustfully to his relationship with his wife, death bringer. Right? I mean, those are bigger ones. But when a wife doesn't ask her husband, so how was your day, and, and, and listen because they're selfishly focused on their own purposes. Guys, it can be like really big things and it can be small things, but we have to realize that outside of Christ, we, how we treat each other when we're engaged in our own thinking, our own selfishness, there's a little bit of death that we bring to our relationships with the people around us. And the cool thing is, so, so that's why this statement is true. Sin brings death and therefore it is justly punished by death. And we all have sinned. We've all acted selfishly. But God sent Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to take our place on the cross and die for us, to pay for our sin. He took our just punishment. 1 Peter 2, 24, He himself bore our sins, is talking about Jesus Christ, in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Ephesians 1 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. As he died on the cross, he shed blood. He shed his blood. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. 1 John 2 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for our sins but alone, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus came to pay for the sins of the world for your sin and for my sin, for my not good and your not good, for my selfishness and for your selfishness. And he shed his blood and died on the cross, and he did that because of God's great love for us. So now how do I take hold of this redemption? How do I make this gift that was given by God through Jesus Christ and him dying on the cross? Mine. How do we take hold of this forgiveness for our sins? We must believe the gospel message to be true. We are saved by grace through faith, through believing in these things as true. And when we truly believe and put our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and God, the one who paid the penalty for our sin, God begins to work within our lives as we enter into a relationship with Him. This gift is received by faith. And you might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't there a bunch of like Christian rules I have to follow? Isn't there like a bunch of things that I have to start doing in order to be saved? No. This gift is received by faith. 
John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. You might ask, but didn't I have, don't I have to follow a bunch of rules? No. You need to believe. You need to believe. And trust in Jesus Christ as your true Lord and Savior. Now, as, his, as, as Jesus being your Lord, He's a Lord, the, the leader, controller, ruler, Lord, that kind of Lord. So that means He's going to call you to things by the leading of the Holy Spirit. He's going to call you to be like, okay, you know what? You need to go talk to your boss about stealing that. And if he's your Lord, you listen, right? He's going to call you to things. Or so maybe the, some of the things that you've done in your life, you know what? You can't, you can't do those anymore. I want you to stop doing those. Those, don't, those aren't going to help you in your walk with me. So that doesn't mean that you're not going to have to do anything. But coming to know Jesus isn't about following a bunch of lists. It's about believing in him as your Lord and Savior and then walking with Him, listening to Him as your Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess your faith and are saved. Romans 10, 13 says, For anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone, no matter what your sin, what your broken or your, no, your not good is, whatever you're hiding, Whatever you've done and whatever has happened to you, it is all forgiven and washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, by believing in who He is and what He has done. By faith in Jesus Christ, you can be made pure and really made new. This is why Easter is such an incredible time, because it is a time of remembering that Jesus did die on the cross for our sin, and He paid the penalty for me and for you. And on the third day, the tomb was empty. Jesus had risen from the dead, showing us that He was Lord over all things and held power over sin and death. The empty tomb shows us and reminds us that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I pray this morning as we remember what He has done and the empty tomb, that you are drawn to worship Him and trust in Him as your Lord and Savior a little more deeply.